everybody. Welcome to worship at uh, South Lake Christian. Uh, if you are visiting with us today, we pray that uh, your experience will be uplifting, but we'd also like to get to know you a little bit better. In our bulletin, there is a little tear-off page right here. It has some uh, area where you can fill out your information, or there's a card in front of you in the, uh, in the back of the seat. Please uh, uh, fill one of those out and drop it in the, in the box in back or hand it to one of us. Uh, we would just like to get to know you a little bit better. We don't have that many announcements this morning. Uh, Judy does want me to announce that next week is the last week for bringing toilet paper for Lake Aurora. You know, they've had their summer program. They kind of have to restock, you know. So let's make sure we send a, a bunch of toilet paper to help them out for the coming year. Also, uh, our Vacation Bible School kicks off tomorrow, uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 12. Uh, if you're part of that, God bless you. Thank you. If you have been thinking about that, you would like to uh, volunteer for that, we want to encourage you to do so. There will be a meeting after this worship service over in the cafe, and lunch will be provided. Uh, please come over there and learn everything that you might want to know about what's going on this week in Vacation Bible School. And if you're considering you know, volunteering, we encourage you to do that. Uh, now I am going to stop talking and we're going to show a little video. Good morning, South Lake. We are worshiping with you from afar and worshiping in spirit with you today. Uh, we're actually recording this from our Ronald McDonald house uh, and our room here that uh, we're just thankful that the many of you that prayed that this would become available for us. Uh, grateful for your prayers and God's provision in that. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we are here because we gave birth to our third son. Uh, well, Kelsey gave birth. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> on July 13th at 1218, he came into this world. Uh, we have named him Ashford Law Hotchkiss. Uh, Ash for short. Law from Lawrence for Kelsey's stepfather and for one of my great-grandfathers. And just uh, paying tribute to our family in that way. But um, we are just uh, enamored with him and so in love with him. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of update on, on where he's at right now. Ashford was born um, healthy and wonderful. We got to spend about a little over an hour with him, but when we made it to our postpartum room, um, before we ever even got to like look at him together, the nurse noticed that he was in some respiratory distress, breathing about 100 breaths per minute, and a normal infant should breathe between 40 and 60. So it was double the rate where we needed him to be. So they took him to the NICU, and we're really, really encouraged because you can see where we started the week. And where we are just, you know, almost four days later, how much God has done in um, strengthening his lungs and helping him learn to breathe on his own. And we are so, so grateful for his progress that many of you have helped pray us through and pray him through. And Ashford has come a long, long way. So our next step is learning to feed more regularly on his own so we can get the feeding tube out. So um, lots of progress already. And we are so grateful for your prayers. Absolutely. Um, we are grateful for your prayers and your support. For many of you who have brought meals to us, we are so thankful for that. Uh, and we are just continually reminded, uh, Ash is uh, short from, from Hebrew for happy or blessed. And we really do feel so blessed in this, uh, even despite all of the shortcomings that we're going through. We see uh, God's provision and God's hand throughout uh, on his little life so far uh, and how much bring, healing he's bringing to his body um, but thank you for, again, thank you for your prayers, your support. Please continue to pray for us and for him and for our boys. Uh, we can't wait to see you soon. Uh, have, a, have a great Sunday. All right, let's go ahead and stand. We'll start our worship together. Sorry, my fault. I messed up. Here we go. <laughs> You make the darkness run and hide, bring the broken back to life. Only you can, only you can. You set me free from every chain, you fill my heart with songs of praise. Only you can, only you can. Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I am wide awake, my heart beats. Only for your glory, my hands dream. Up for you to hold me, my soul sings. Father, you are holy, my feet dance. To your rhythm, to your rhythm, every beat is calling. Every beat is calling out your name. 
You left the glory of your throne to bring this run away back home. Only you can, only you can. You give me love, you give me life, you keep me dancing through the night. Only you can, only you can. My heart beats only for your glory. My hands reach up for you to hold me. My soul sings. Father, you are holy, my feet dance to your rhythm, to your rhythm. Every feet is calling, every feet is calling out your name. Every feet is calling, every feet is calling out your name. Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I am wide awake. You move me, your freedom is consuming. I feel it rushing through me. I'll never be the same. My heart beats only for your glory. My hands reach up for you to hold. My soul sings, Father, you are holy, my feet dance, to your rhythm, to your rhythm, every beat is calling, every beat is calling on your name, every beat is calling, every beat is calling on your name, every beat is calling. Every beat is calling on your name. Amen. What is this love that won't relent? That's calling out with heaven's breath. Who's reaching wide to save our souls? Only you. What is this grace that makes no sense? That we could never recommend? Who gives us all a second chance? Only you. Only you. Only you. stars upon the night and showed the sun how bright to shine who shaped the world within his hands only you who set the sky upon the hill and told the waters to be still spoke to form the universe, only you, only you, only you, there is no one like our God, there is no one like our God, there is no other God who can save, there is no one like our God. 
When I was asked to do this meditation this morning, first thing that came to my mind was a story about a big building project. Two workers were laying brick. One of the workers, when he was asked what he did, he said, I work here from eight to five, five days a week, laying brick. Conversely, the other man was asked uh, what he did. And he said, I am building a great, beautiful cathedral. What was the difference between those two? One had a job, came and did it, and left. The other one had, perchance, seen the building programs, the building plans, and he knew what the end product was. Now, how does that relate to us this morning in communion? 
Well, Jesus understood the Master's plan, the Father's plan, and he was committed to it. And that plan was resulting in Calvary and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross at that Calvary. And he was committed to it all the way, every step. I'd like to give you three examples today of how Jesus showed that commitment to the Father and the program that he had, the plan that he had of going to the cross for salvation for you and me. First of all is in Luke chapter 2. And the account is Jesus when he was young. He was 12 years old. And his parents and him uh, journeyed to Jerusalem for the Passover. And you may be familiar with this. And on the way back, Jesus got separated from the parents. And they hunted for three days for him and could not find him. Finally, they found him. He was, he was in the temple and he was discussing scriptures with the elders. And they said, Jesus, why did you do that to us that we were so distraught and he said didn't you know I had to be in my father's house he was committed even at age 12 and the second uh, indication uh, of Jesus was in Matthew 26 and that had to do with Gethsemane where he prayed multiple times father if it be your will take this cup from me because he knew what was coming but he always ended that with, nevertheless, your will be done. He was committed to go all the way to Calvary for you and me. And the third instance was the same night uh, when he was betrayed and the soldiers were coming to arrest him. If you remember, Peter drew his sword and cut the ear off of one of the servants of the uh, uh, officials. Jesus said, stopped him and said, Jesus, Peter, put your sword back away. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has for me to drink? I think we can look very quickly and see that the commitment that Jesus had all the way to Calvary without flinching for you and me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the plan that you have and had and that Jesus was willing to follow that plan. He was committed to it all the way to the terrible death on the cross for mankind, for you and for me. And we thank you for that, Lord, and just pray that you will uh, bring it to our hearts as we take communion today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father. in the service where we pray over the offering and if you are visiting you'll notice that we don't pass the plate here we have a box in the back for tithes and offerings and if you are visiting uh, a reminder to tear off that uh, portion uh, and put it in the uh, box or the visitor's card in the back of the seat in front of you if you are watching online uh, you can go to slcc.church and click on the giving tab and uh, you can give that way. Let's pray. Father, you're so good to us. 
And we just are so grateful that uh, we are called your children, that you made a way for us, that Jesus, you were obedient all the way to the cross, and you did that for us. And we just thank you. And we ask you to bless the, the gift and the giver now, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this week was a good week for uh, Bryce to have a vacation. <laughs> uh, they have been uh, pretty well wrapped up with things and a little bit of uncertainty about when their little one would be born. Uh, so uh, it was hard to, to get a guest speaker outside of our church. Uh, but I want to thank Bryce and the elders for allowing me to come and be here. I uh, retired from full-time ministry in, night, or in 2008. So I uh, was in full-time ministry for 34 years altogether, and uh, it's not uh, unusual then for me to, to be behind the pulpit and to do things. But I want us to pray for some people, and then we're going to get right into our message. Uh, I want us to uh, look at uh, the uh, Thanksgiving for Doug Fisher. Many of you don't know Doug, uh, but uh, he moved to Atlanta recently with his wife and, and got a brain tumor, but now I understand that, he, that the treatments have been successful, prayers have been answered, and that he's cancer-free for now. So isn't that wonderful? That's great. Yes, thank you, Lord. And we still want to remember Joe Meyer's sister, Jean Tidwell. She's uh, battling with cancer things. Also, uh, one of our ladies, Joe Schofield, has uh, been receiving drug treatments uh, to shrink the, the tumor that she has and that uh, getting ready then for surgery, and that is coming up in the near future. So we want to, to be in prayer uh, for her as she uh, gets ready for that. And then some of you know uh, Bob Ingram. They were with us for a few years ago, but moved over to Traveris area to retire in that area. But he passed away in the month of April, in case uh, some of you remember Ruby. Uh, she's there by herself. And then also a lady by the name of Joan Kidd uh, had a stroke. Uh, she's a former member here uh, uh, for a few years ago, and we want to lift these folks up to our prayer. We keep a, a bulletin filled with uh, folks who need prayers. So you can check, check it out, the prayer list, and I, I encourage you to keep that close at hand. So let's pray, and then we'll get right into our message. Uh, our Father, we thank you so much that uh, you are our partner wherever we are, whether on a uh, time of surgery, whether we are battling emotions that go with that surgery, whether we're with loved ones who we care about and watch them go through difficult times. Uh, Father, we've named these few, but there are others in our hearts that we lift up to you. You know each of our hearts, and I pray that you would minister in the way that, only way that you can. Uh, to meet each need, and we thank you, Father, for the answered prayer and the gift of, of healing that you do give our bodies, souls, and spirits. So help us this morning to hear a word from you that uh, we can uh, be good, uh, honor you through each day, and be blessed because of it. Thank you now, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Today I want us to take a journey, if you'd like to follow in your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 27, because we are going to be seeing how God answered a prayer, and we're going to see how the Apostle Paul had requested prayer from people from Rome, the city of Rome. Uh, in the 15th chapter of, of Romans, he specifically requests that the people pray for his safety, that he would be safe as he traveled around because he had enemies wherever he went because of his stance on the gospel. And uh, in uh, chapter uh, 15, then he asked for them to pray for him. So we're going to watch how that prayer is being answered, and, and Acts 27 is going to do it. Now, in the setting of it, the Apostle Paul had gone to Jerusalem. He had been in ministry, had made uh, three trips uh, around Turkey primarily and parts of Israel. Uh, so here he is. He is in Jerusalem, and a lot of people told lies about what he was doing, and a riot ensued, and people there in that area wanted to kill him. 
uh, they wanted to beat him to death, act, literally. And so the Roman soldiers saw this skirmish that was taking place, and they then went, went to rescue uh, whoever was being uh, abused. So there the soldiers are, and Paul had the uh, ability to tell the soldier that he was actually a born Roman citizen. And so they knew right away that they had to protect this man. So they took him, had him brought away from the crowd, but there were still people who were very, very angry with him and who wanted to kill him. In fact, there were 40 people who got together and said, we're not going to eat until we kill this man. That's how much of an enemy he, he had. Uh, so the apostle Paul then uh, needed some help. So the Roman soldiers took him to save his life and to give him a due process of law. So they took him to their barracks. They had other prisoners there, but they took him to a place where he could be kept safe. And he had had some interviews with uh, Felix and, and Festus and, and other uh, royalty leaders of, uh, of the Jewish court system and the Roman court system. And uh, he had made an appeal then to go to Rome to make his testimony to uh, Caesar. So the, the soldiers then protected him at this time. And while he was in the barracks, he had a vision, not only a vision, but he had a visitation. Let me read to you from Acts chapter 23, uh, verse 11, as we're, as we're thinking today about how Jesus is really our power over trouble. He said, as he's there in this room by himself, the following night the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Now, remember what's happening here. This is the man who had been crucified, who had walked on the face of the earth for 40 days and 40 nights after he was raised from the dead and then ascended into heaven. And he's been in heaven now for several years. And Jesus is the one who came down to tell Paul, Paul, I want you to go. In fact, you have to go. I'm giving you an assignment. You are going to be going to Rome. Because I want you to testify. I want you just to tell your personal experience. I want you to be able to tell the folks there in Rome in the, the courtyard of Caesar himself about what you have experienced in me, how you had a vision of me, how you uh, have seen so many miracles and, and the, the things that have been done. I need you to get there. So I'm going to guarantee you, Paul, it's going to take some courage. You're going to have to breathe deep. Because you're going to have trouble on the way. Now, trouble was nothing new to Paul. I mean, this poor guy, every place he went as he gave testimony to the Lord, he had trouble where he went. I mean, he was stoned, he was killed one time, he was raised from the dead. All kinds of things continued to happen to Paul as he gave his testimony around primarily Turkey and uh, down into Israel as well. And so here is Paul. He, he knows that trouble is, is going to come his way. Trouble followed him wherever he went because of his testimony for Jesus. But, you know, something else went with him, not just trouble, but Jesus went with him. He learned that Jesus would be protecting him to accomplish the task that he was given. Whatever that task was, wherever he was supposed to go and teach, he knew that Jesus would empower him to accomplish the fulfillment of that task. And so, actually, he, he was saying, all right, I will go. When uh, the Apostle Paul had uh, his first encounter with Jesus, you know, you might remember the story, how he was going up to a city called Damascus, the same Damascus that's on, in the modern map world today, very same place. Paul was going from Jerusalem up to Damascus, and the Lord appeared to him there. And the Lord gave a, a vision of, of him and what his assignment was going to be. During this time, Paul was blinded for three days. And he was then sent to, into the city of Damascus. And a man by the name of Ananias then was to give him further instruction. And so that's what happened. Uh, he went there to uh, meet with Ananias. And as a part of all of this encountering of Jesus, Jesus told him these words. Because as he's giving him an assignment, he's saying to him, now I'm going to send you to the world. I'm going to send you to the Jews. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles as well. So here's his word in Acts 26, 17. He said, 
Jesus is speaking to him. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. And so here he is, given the assignment, knowing he's going to be rescued. He's going, he is constantly going to be in trouble. He's constantly going to be haunted by enemies. He's going to be rescued. Now that's what is happening here in this 27th chapter. Another time where Jesus is going to be rescuing Paul. And the message that I hope that you will receive this morning is that Jesus wants to be your power over your trouble. The same way that he helped the Apostle Paul in whatever situation he was in, then he was available for that. Jesus was available. So we're going to learn that. Let's read Acts 27, verses 1 through 3, if you follow along in your Bible. If not, it will be uh, right up there on the screen. So this is where the story starts. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some of other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adumitium, and about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. So, Paul's journey to Rome has begun. He's been there in Caesarea, uh, not terribly far from uh, Jerusalem. He gets on a boat with other prisoners, and Julius and his soldiers are going to be on the boat with them, and they travel up the Mediterranean Sea, if you kind of know where that is. And one of the things that is interesting is that uh, Paul is going to be traveling not far from where he grew up. He grew up in a place called Tarsus, which is a part of a southeastern part of, of present-day Turkey. And he grew up in a community that was not very far from the Mediterranean Sea, just, just a few miles. They were inland a little ways, but just a few miles. So he knew where they were going. This was familiar territory to him. He's going to be sailing up the Mediterranean Sea along the coastline there. If you can maybe picture it in your mind, and they're going to go up not far from where he grew up there in Tarsus and uh, on over toward the little island of Crete. And so these ships, as you remember, uh, were old ships. They depended upon the wind. Uh, that's how they got around. Uh, they were at the mercy of the weather. So that's what this story is going to be about. It's going to help us understand how they traveled, but the challenges that were there. So now let me pick it up at verse 9. So there we are, if you're following along with me. He's telling the story how much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. In other words, they ignored what Paul said. They kept on sailing. And so now it's helpful for us to know that one of the ways the Lord helps us over trouble is through common sense. Paul was using common sense when he told them, we don't know that God sent him a vision of the storm that, that they were going to be encountering. But he was aware of the season, just like we know about the hurricane season here in Florida and this area. We know when it starts. We know about when it's over, what to look out for. We know when to tune into to the TV station. We're aware of these things. That's what Paul was aware of. He was aware, we found in our reading, that they were at the Day of Atonement. That's in the month of October. That's the beginning of the storm season there around this area of the Mediterranean season. So he was just using his knowledge and common sense knowledge of, hey, it's not too smart to be out here on a ship that depends on wind for its direction and for its empowerment. Now, I, I think that there are times when uh, all of us uh, struggle with seeking advice of others. Maybe you're like me. There's times when, when I just, you know, I want to do it by myself, a little bit of independence. Uh, don't want to talk to too many people about how do I go about doing this or what's the answer for that. Um, but through the years, haven't you found that if you will talk to some other people about things, 
that you really are helped? Listen to what Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10 says. It says, when there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Did that that ever catch your attention? Where there is strife, there is pride. We all struggle with our pride at times. We all struggle with being humble enough to say, I could use a little help. I I want to know what you think about this. I, I want to go to the Lord and see what he has to say about this. The Apostle Paul had done that. He had been submitted to the Lord. He said, Lord, I want to do your will. Take with me. And so you teach me. So we have to look out for pride, how it comes into us at times, and and be willing to listen and be willing to take some advice from other people. Proverbs 15, 22 says it like this. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. And so you and I need to understand that uh, we need counsel at times. We're helped when we get counsel. I encourage you, swallow your pride at times. Get out there and seek the help that you need. And just don't be your own answer person all the time. You'll be blessed because of it. That's, that's what we're learning here right now. Use common sense about some things. Jesus will help you. Well, let's continue on. Let's look at verse 18. Because the journey continues, and here he is talking about the storm they had. So, beginning with verse 18. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. And when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice and not to sail from Crete. Then you would have been spared yourselves this damage and this loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve and stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all those who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. So the picture is storms come our way. Storms of life, here's, here's a physical storm coming their way. And when that happens, whether it's a storm of the circumstances of life or a little weather storm, it's time to remove some things. God guides us to remove some things. He said it's time to clear the deck. You know, for example, uh, all of you who have been parents identify with uh, the Hotchkiss family right now because in many ways, this li- new little life that they had, this Asher that's just come along, is controlling everything. They've lost control. And they'll lose control for what? 25 years or something like that? (laughs) That's the way it is. So you and I, in order to get along in life, we have to remove some things, just like Bryce and Kelsey right now, and every person who's been a, a parent has to do. I mean, you have to remove your privacy. You don't have a whole lot of it. You have to remove your schedule. You don't have total control over your schedule. The family controls a lot of that. The fa- I mean, for example, this little one said, was sort of uh, giving indications that he wanted to come into the world. And so uh, two or three weeks ago, they made a trip. So, Is it time for this little one to come? Well, no, not yet. So they went back home. And then we finally get notice that, uh, oh, we're we're going to be trying. We think he's going to be born on Monday. So we're going to go to the hospital on Monday. Well, Monday 
came and went. The child wasn't born. Oh, okay, he's going to be born on Tuesday. No, he wasn't, didn't come on Tuesday. Finally, on, on Wednesday afternoon, uh, he came. And then, of course, as you saw in the, in the video, that uh, there were some problems there and, and is in uh, good hands. Uh, you know, NICU, they've learned so much how to take care of little ones in trouble. Uh, I've been inside those rooms several times, and, and these people know what they're doing. They're specialists, and we're grateful to God for them. But the point is that uh, Bryce and Kelsey uh, have lost a little bit of control of their lives, as we all do. You know, for example, when I say this time, they're from time to time to remove some things, to kind of clear the deck, sometimes aren't there attitudes that we would be a better person if we changed our attitude? Uh, aren't there times in our lives when we might have a behavior uh, that is really hurting a relationship? Uh, you know, there have been times, in, you know, let me give you an example, a personal example now. Uh, my wife and I have been married 57 years, so we've experienced uh, a, a lot of life during all of that. And I remember one of the times in our married life that I had kind of a bad habit of interrupting her. I, I see some of you poking each other now. <laughs> but but, but it, was, it, it bothered her, you know, of course it did. And so finally, you know, she would, she would make a comment to me, stop interrupting me. So I came back one day and, and when she said something about it and I said, well, if you would just stop breathing in between times, maybe I can stop interrupting you. Well, that wasn't a very good answer, so it didn't go over too well. <laughs> well, anyway, I mean, marriage is hard. It's just hard work. And, and that's what we ought to expect if you're going to make it over a period of time like the Lord wants you to do, like what he's blessed you to do. It takes some effort. You have to get rid of some things. There are things you need to change. There are efforts you need to make. Now, are there some good ways to learn what those need to be? Are there some things that we can do to help ourselves discover what we need to get rid of our lives in? Well, we've, something we've done for many years that's a big help. Uh, we just did it, did it recently, as a matter of fact. Uh, talk. Just talk about what is going on. And one of the ways we've learned to talk about it is to go to each other from time to time and say, are there some things right now, I want, I want you to tell me three things that I could do to make life better for you. Are there three things that I could do that would be a blessing to you? And then you listen. And you say, well, I can't promise that I'm going to do all three things. But I know what you're thinking, and I will try some. That's what I will guarantee. The thing that happens is nobody ever got uh, in trouble with their relationship because they understood everything. When we, it's when we don't understand what is going on that we get ourselves in trouble. And so here we've got these storms in life that comes to us. There's some things that we need to throw overboard, and there's some things we need to learn from each other in our families or in our relationships of, of all kinds. And find out what's going on, and then you'll know how to go, move forward with it. So remember, God guides us to remove some things. Just like they threw stuff overboard, that's what we need to do. Clear the deck sometimes, all right? Now, here's something that helps. He said, um, you got trouble? Ask for help. Just ask me for help. These people here, they had no hope. I mean, the storms came raging in, and they, they, they all believed they were going to die. And then Paul, as you remember, had this visit from an angel, and this angel gave them reassurance that everything was going to be okay. And so this angel was the assurance that God was there to help over this time of trouble, to be there and available. So, so the angel guided, and the angel gave word then that they were going to be saved. Now, there were three people who knew everything was going to be okay. His name is not named. He's talking about how we got on board. Well, who is we? Well, that's going to be Luke, who was Paul's personal uh, physician and traveled around a lot with him. And then there was this guy by the name of Aristarchus, who was a Christian who 
traveled uh, quite a bit with Paul and kind of became a personal servant for him. So Paul, Aristarchus, and Luke all knew that the angel had visited and said everything is going to be okay. So from this point on, the people on the boat listened to Paul, and they followed his instructions. They learned that he knew what he was talking about. So they ate when he said it's okay to eat. So that was good. They threw grain overboard. He, he gave uh, insight into that. Another way that, that he gave them insight was the sailors. The sailors on this trip wanted to save their own skin. And so they were going to take the only lifeboat and leave early and leave, abandon everybody. Paul got on to that, and he then told Julius, the uh, Roman centurion, and he said what was going to be going on, and he said, now, if you let those sailors leave, you're going to die. Because Paul knew that, that there was a chance that uh, they are going to need those sails hoisted up in the air again, and they're going to need those sailors to do that. And so Julius went over and had the, had the soldiers cut the ropes. The lifeboat then went down into the water, the raging water, and, and it went off on its own. The sailors are on board. So here's where we learned that when daylight came, they all saw land that it was close by, and they, they cut the anchors loose then. They hoisted the sails up and guided the ship toward the land. And they hit a sandbar, and the boat was stuck, and uh, the centurion had actually planned to kill all of the prisoners. But because he wanted to save the Apostle Paul, he didn't kill any of the prisoners. 261 people were saved because Paul was on that ship. And Paul was on that ship because he was submitted to God's will, to doing God's will. Let's make sure we're understanding the main message this morning. If you want to experience Christ's power in your life, if you want to have him cooperate with you and help you when you're in trouble, the secret is to continue to seek his will. Don't get out there on your own. Don't let your pride uh, get you in trouble. Seek his will, what it, whatever it is. And some of his will is very easy to understand. You know, don't kill and so on. There's some commandment that there's no debate about. There's other times when it's a little more difficult. But the secret to you having good power in your life and good guidance from the Lord Jesus is to be submitted to his will and say, I want to do what you want me to do. That's what happened. The Apostle Paul. You know, they landed on what is now, now we know as Malta, a major World War II place. And that's where they ended up spending some time. So I don't have time to go into the rest of that story. But they all lived because the Apostle Paul was there. And the Apostle Paul was there because he was following God's will. And he will lead you and he will guide you in your times, whatever it is, no matter what it is. If you're doing it in his will, then he will empower you and he will make his presence known. Let me give you a personal illustration. <clears throat> uh, one of the churches that, that I served, we were there for 10 years. We had two churches we were, we were at for 10 years. One in Edwards in Georgia, one in Columbus, Indiana. And so uh, I was uh, there in the, my sixth year at the Garden City Christian Church. It's just outside of, of Columbus, a little community called Garden City. Uh, so we were in our sixth year, and God had really... Uh, bless the ministry in, in just every way you can imagine. We had totally relocated from our old building just a few miles down the road to a brand new 10 acres of land, and we had a big new building and everything, and it was, it was you just saw God's power uh, coming true all the time. It was a wonderful time. So here we are, we're in the new building, and uh, I'm at a place where I say, I don't know what to do next. I mean, I, I was in trouble. I did not know. Now, do you agree with me that every church, to be a healthy church, needs to be a church that reaches out to other people? Amen? Get a little amen? amen? That's the way it should be. That's the healthy church. I wanted our church to always be healthy. But I just didn't know how to keep the growth coming. I just didn't know. I, I, I was dumbfounded. I found a seminar that was going to be available in Seattle, Washington. I knew about the preacher. I knew about the church. And so I told our leadership, I said, guys, I said, I, I, need, I need some help. But I think this program out here can give me the guidance I need, and I can come back and, and tell you, you know, what we can do next to keep things going well. 
So they agreed to pay my air flight out to Seattle and to sponsor me uh, to go on that, that trip. And so that was our prayer. This was God's will. This was what he wanted us to do. We wanted to keep growing. We wanted uh, to learn how to do what we needed to do, changes we needed to make in order to make it happen. One problem. When it was time for the air flight, I had just learned that my first cousin, I was the best man at his wedding. His name, call him Frosty. His name was Forrest. Uh, Frosty had just been killed. He was the air flight manager, the engineer, the flight engineer on the uh, United 261. And it went down in Seattle. Uh, it didn't uh, hit a lot of houses or things like that, but 10 people died uh, as a result of that. I did not want to get on that plane. I'm telling you, I was, I was shaken. I just lost my cousin that, that I treasured. And uh, I just didn't want to do it. But I knew it was God's will. I knew that's what he wanted us to do as a church and as me, as a leader of that church. So I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me because, because I'm scared. I just don't want to do it. He, he helped me find a way to accomplish that because I found the verse, Psalm 34, 7, where it says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Now, I knew the angel was down here. I never thought about the angel being up there. And I just took that verse while I was on that airplane flight, and I just visualized the angels all around us. We went every mile, 10,000 feet up in the air, and I just knew that everything was going to be good. And it was. I got out there. I was calm all of that time, and we came back, and I was able to put the, the, what I had learned into practice, and God continued to bless us in some, in some wonderful ways. And we wouldn't have had those blessings had I not taken that trip. What am I saying? Learn what his will is. Seek it. Find out what things he wants you to do to glorify him and to help build his kingdom especially. And, and to seek first the kingdom of God wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever that is. Seek his will. And he will empower you and he will give you power over your trouble, whatever it is that you're dealing with. He will be there with you. And so I want to encourage you this morning to, to do what I did many years ago as a young person. When the Apostle Paul uh, was there with Ananias, I did what the Apostle Paul did. I encourage you to do the same. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Acts 22, 16 gives us these words where, where Ananias is, is looking at Paul and having this conversation, and then he says to Paul, he said, what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized. Washing away your sins. Calling on the name of Jesus. That's what I encourage you to do. To get started in the power. To let Jesus be the power in your life and to guide you through your life so that you can have the kind of success whether you're here or whether you're up there in the air wherever you are to be with you, to empower you to accomplish his will. Let us pray together. Father, now we thank you so much that you love us, that you are patient with us, that you travel with us through every circumstance of our life. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage anyone here who needs to make a decision for you, who needs to step forward and to say, I want to be a Christian. I want Jesus' power in my life. I want him to be my guide and my guard, to be close to my heart. We thank you, Father, that Jesus is ever present with us today, and we thank you that he is still here to guide and direct us. Help us to trust you. In his name I pray. Amen.
Thank you, Bill. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing, sing in my heart. percent together on a prayer request and that is we're asking all of you to be in prayer for uh, the uh, search for a youth minister uh, we are committed we are committed to saying we want to reach children and teenagers and the entire family and we want to do our part to do that but we need prayer to, for God to guide the right person to us we recently had an interview with someone and the comment was made, we don't want someone to come here for two years. We want someone to come here for five years and to be with us and to help us accomplish something that's really pretty difficult. We're out here by ourselves. We don't have a school system around us or a natural children's venue around us. It's going to take some special efforts. There's two ways to do it. You either have to go get them and bring them, or you have to have things that entice them or make it easy for them to come. And so that's what we need a youth minister for. Right now, we believe that our desire to reach the children and the teenagers uh, is dependent on finding the right youth minister. We could be wrong on that. We're open, listening to what the Lord's guidance is, but that's what we think right now. I mean, you can do a lot without a full-time person, but there are times when it's right to take that action, and we think that's what we need to do. So let's all be in prayer for that. God's people said... Amen. Amen. All right, Tom, thank you. All right, just remain standing because this will be quick. I uh, just want to remind you that there is a meeting right after service in the cafe. Lunch will be provided for all those who are committed to the Vacation Bible School this week. 
If you are even considering that you might like to help out, even if you can give us a day or two, we would encourage you to do that and come to the meeting today in the cafe. Let's go ahead and have a prayer, and then we'll have a quick song as we complete. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity we've come today to, to worship. We just pray, Father, now that you will help us this week as we plant seeds of faith into these little hearts, that those seeds will grow into a mighty forest of faith that will help them withstand the storms of life that are coming. And we pray, Father, as a church, that you will help us to hold their hand through their life and help them uh, go through all these trials that they will go through in this life and together, because that's what it's all about. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My heart beats only for your glory. My hands reach up for you to hold me. My soul sings. Father, you are holy. My feet dance to your rhythm, to your rhythm. Every beat is calling. Every beat is calling on your name. Every beat is calling. Every beat is calling on your name. Every beat is calling. Every beat is calling on your name. Thank you, folks. We'll see you next week.